I would love to be singing that song when he splits heaven and we come and join him and just fall at his feet in those first moments and sing majesty, sing glory to him. And then when we come back to with him, just to, to cover all, all of space with our voices in praise, singing hallelujah to our great God. When we think of all he has done for us, the suffering, and, I, and I'm not talking about the human, the physical, that horrible, but the holy God becoming the sin bearer that we might be able to go into his presence. How can we not sing his praises? How can we not lift his name on high? How can we not rejoice? How can we not want to put heal to our words of praise and thanksgiving and serve our majestic God? Hallelujah. 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 I'll get one more minute because he has to go. <laughs> I've shared it with you before, but let me just remind you. There was a little boy very poor neighborhood, Chicago, where Moody uh, had his huge church. This little guy snuck into church. In ragged clothes, he had nothing. He <coughs> loved Yeshua Jesus. He loved Jesus. And his whole heart, as he heard the sermon that day, was just welling up in his love for the Lord. And the offering plate went by, and he knew what that meant. And he had absolutely nothing to put in that offering plate. And as he watched it go by, and he could not even put a penny in, he didn't have a penny to put in, it broke his heart. And he was inside, and his heart was just saying to, to the Lord, I, I'm, I'm so sorry, I have nothing to give you. He watched that offering plate go all the way through. He watched him take it back down and put it on the front, right in front of the altar. And suddenly, just on impulse, he got up, and he walked down that aisle. And he took that offering plate off of the table, and he put it on the floor, and then he stepped into it. Mm. Jesus, I give you all of me. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm a puddle takeover. <laughs> Praise God. I Hallelujah. Put these glasses where if you don't. God, I'm take care of you. If I'm walking a little slower, it's because I'm a little older. <laughs> and uh, my legs aren't what they used to be. I'm 66 years old. And so I don't uh, move as I used to. Well, we're just back from the desert. Went out looking at uh, prospective land out there in Nevada and uh, was it Monday? I think it was Monday we went to um, the Hoover Dam mm -hmm. and where we parked we had to go up what was it? Bridge. Did you see the bridge? You have to see the bridge but you have to go up like 10,000 stairs. <laughs> they have a ramp so we chose the ramp. I almost made it to the top, and the heavens were opening. Well, I thought I was having a heart attack. Literally, I couldn't feel the whole left side of my body. I couldn't breathe, and I'm just perspiring. Well, it was 111 degrees. And um, so it was a very, how would I say it? It was an epiphany because my whole purpose going out to the desert is to hear the voice of the Lord. But um, I heard it. <laughs> it's not your time. <laughs> it's, and what I saw and what I heard, Francis bearing witness that it was, I need to get out of here. I need to get to a hospital because I don't know what's happening. Well, anyway. It wasn't what I thought it was. <clears throat> it was one of those episodes of uh, you're winded, you're hyperventilating, and it's not a good 
thing to go up and exert yourself in 111 degree heat. I felt embarrassed because there were people twice my age going up there like nothing. So when you're not used to exerting yourself, you're, you're not keeping yourself where you, the way you should be. Um, you'll feel it. It's called being sluggish. And sluggishness is something that uh, we can become even in our spiritual life. We have to keep spiritually fit. Prayer. The word of the Lord. Gathering together. Worshiping. Praising our God. How many of us know that that's what keeps us connected with the Lord? We need to, to be at the waters daily. Because we have a spiritual thirst. We, have, we need to eat the manna that God gives us. That's the word of God. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. And to be at the wellsprings of water, when you're in the middle of the desert, water is a precious commodity. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long you can live without food. But my understanding is you will die very quickly if you don't have water to drink. So that's another hint. Do we have water okay. to drink? Yes. So it's good to be back in California. A whole week in Nevada taught me something. That I don't want to live in the deserts of Nevada. And I look forward to the coming season here when we have cooler temperatures and we can enjoy um, the fall season. October being my favorite month of the year. And October 7th of 24 will mark one year that Israel has been at war. And it doesn't seem like it's letting up anytime soon, so we don't know what the future holds. What I can tell you is, is that as saints of the Most High God, we must always be ready and prepared. I have said it time and time again, the voice of the Lord speaking, prepare the saints for war. Prepare the saints for war. What does that mean? It just simply means we have to be prepared. Because we don't know when the adversary will strike. Israel right now is going through a very anxious time, mm -hmm. not knowing when the enemy will strike. Yes. It would be better for Iran to make up its mind and carry out its threats instead of just keeping them guessing. But being under threat is something that Israel's used to. In the days of Hezekiah, the great reformer king, Israel was under threat. There was a man by the name of Senashuri who delivered a letter that was very threatening. Assyria wanted to expand its empire. And we know that Assyria is modern day what? Iran. Iran. What has changed? The question is how long will Israel continue to be under threat? until she sees the peace that Messiah has promised her. Are we not looking forward to that age of peace we call the age of the Messiah, the Messianic age? And who is looking forward to the coming of the Mashiach? Well, most Jews that I talk to and have interactions with are looking forward to that coming age, the coming of the Messiah. So when I get to the question of who is the Messiah? Mm -hmm. What is going to be the answer, Rochelle? Yeshua. 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 That's what we say. That's what God says. And that's what God says. But what do the Jewish scribes say? And that's what we're going to be discussing this morning. What do the scribes say? What have they been saying about 
the coming Messiah. Because you see, the Jews have been waiting for their Messiah long before there was a Christian church. You see, the whole idea of Messiah didn't begin with Christianity 2,000 years ago. Matter of fact, Israel has been looking for the coming of the Messiah that had been promised thousands of years before there was a church. So I got news for Christians. The Jews have been waiting a long time for the coming of the Messiah. And what will be the sign of his coming and the end of the age? Have not the Jewish people been asking that question for thousands of years? Yes. So this morning I'm going to introduce you to one Jewish man that we read about. His name is Matthew. And I believe Matthew was a Levi. Because he wrote a gospel, and he wrote it specifically to what group of people, Rochelle? His Jewish brothers. Jewish. His Jewish brothers. And we are men of Israel, and we are preaching and teaching to who? To all the Gentile Christians. Is that what we do? What do we do? To the Jew first. We, to the Jew. Because the Gentiles have got hundreds of thousands of churches all over the world preaching the gospel to them. How many churches are preaching the gospel to the Jews? <clears throat> so, I ask for no forgiveness, being zealous for the mission that we've been called to, to the Jew. <clears throat> to the Jew. What a privilege. What a privilege it is to take the gospel to the Jew. Because we always ask, well, what about the Gentiles? Well, the Gentiles have had 2,000 years of gospel and hundreds of thousands of ministries rising up every year taking the gospel to the Gentiles. But what about the Jew? So, to the Jew. <clears throat> and that was the epiphany that I had in the desert. You see, because when you are ready to pass out from the desert heat, how much higher do I have to climb, Lord? And when you think you're near death and you see the brightness, that must have been the desert heat. And your heart is palpitating, palpitating. And you are just pouring, 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 pouring. You're hyperventilating. You're thinking to yourself, at any moment, <clears throat> I could be standing in the presence of the Lord. And at that moment, I thought to myself, I'm not ready. Because our ministry has not fulfilled its mission to the Jewish people. So like Hezekiah, he was given 15 years, an extension Extra. of life. Extra. <laughs> Bonus. So here's the question, Amanda. What will we do with an extra 15 years? What will we do with that? What can happen in the next 15 years? But God has revealed it to us in his word that these perilous times are coming. Matter of fact, the scripture says that men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And if any of you have ever been to Las Vegas, you're right in the midst of it. It's everywhere. So, we're living in a world that doesn't seek God. And when you ask people about the coming of the Messiah, what's going to happen? They're going to think you're crazy. Because the majority of the world doesn't believe that your God and my God, our God, is God.
and that the Holy Scriptures that you have in front of you is truly the Word of God. So if they don't believe in your God, how are you going to tell them the life that they're living goes against God that they don't believe exists? And if they don't believe that your God exists, then how are they going to agree with you when, it, when you stand in defense of Israel and tell them that the Jews have a right to the land that God gave them? But they don't believe that your God, my God, our God, the God of Israel, who made the promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to Israel, as an everlasting covenant, that his people Israel would live in perpetuity in the land that we know as the land flowing with milk and honey. If the world doesn't believe that your God exists, then all we are is a bunch of chatterboxes. Who's going to believe our report? Just because you believe in Jesus doesn't mean they believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So don't assume everybody believes in Jesus. The worst thing that we could do as Christians is go to the Jewish people shoving Jesus down their throats and judging them because is it a sin not to believe in Jesus? That's a question. Yes. It is a sin yes. not to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That means that every Jewish person, men, women, and children, right now on this planet, if they don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, then they're living their lives right now in sin. And what is the future of sinners? Will they live or will they die? So look at every Jewish person that you come in contact with. If they don't believe in Jesus, their future is not life. It is death. They are not living under the blessings of God. They are actually living under the curse. That is the gospel truth. And so, with that having been said, let us go to Mark's Gospel. Now, why do we want to go to Mark's Gospel to learn about Matthew? What does Mark know about Matthew? He was a student. He was a student. We read about Mark. Paul didn't like Mark. You remember? Yeah. Mark was related to Barnabas, Paul's missionary partner in the beginning, but then they got into a fight because they didn't agree. John Mark left us. He was all excited about going into the mission field with us, but then he what? Abandoned. He abandoned. He abandoned his post. signs up for missionary work and then turns around and abandons that. That's like going into the military and refusing to go to war. Right? You enlisted, right? And you said, nope, I don't like where I'm being sent. There's a war going on out there. I had a different take on military. So I thought I was going to get stationed in San Diego. I get to come home on weekends and be with my mom and dad and be in uniform but st and then go to work Monday through Friday and come home. I had no idea they were going to ship me to the Middle East where there was conflict going on. Are those real missiles being shot? What are we doing out here? That's like most Christians that want to follow Jesus with the condition that we don't go into the tribulation period. Oh, well, it's getting quiet in here. I'll follow you, Jesus, wherever you send me, as long as you don't send me where? <laughs> to the Jewish people. <clears throat> because if you're going to hang around the Jews, you might risk 
being hated by the rest of the world that hates the Jewish people, you might even end up in the tribulation period. God forbid that Christians should see the time of Jacob's trouble. So we love what the scribes say about the tribulation period. Church, you ain't going to be part of it. And we love that. We can put on the uniform of soldiers in the army of the Lord, but we don't have to go to war. Because Jesus is going to pull his armies out of the world before the time of Jacob's trouble starts. Yes. When the Jewish people need more hope in the Messiah, the Messiah is going to bail out of the planet and take his church with him and leave the Jews to fend for themselves. Why would he do that if he was truly their Messiah? Jesus, the scribes have said, the church is not going into the tribulation period. That's the message I was told. Scribes. The scribes. Who are the scribes? Were they not the biblical scholars of the day? Do we have scribes today? And what are they saying about the tribulation period? You don't have to go. In the time of Jacob's trouble, Jacob will have to fend for himself. And the Jews will have to deal with themselves. The church will be gone. Jesus has left the planet. Get over it. You had your chance. If you had listened to what the church was preaching all these years, maybe you want to have to go into the tribulation period. But the Bible I read makes a promise to Israel. I will never leave you nor forsake, nor forsake you. Okay. Except the church. Because the church is not planning to help you, Israel, in your time of trouble. But that's the plan of God. Amen. So let's open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 2, and let's begin at verse 13. Now, he, being Jesus, went out again by the sea. That's why I told you. Jesus is recruiting sailors who like to be by the sea. Amen. If the armies of the Lord won't go, the Navy will. Thank you for getting that. No one else got that. And all the multitude came to him. And he taught them. That's what Jesus does. Who were the multitudes, Rochelle? Were they Gentiles or were they Jews? Actually, in that area, they were both. But it was the Jewish ones that he was speaking to. He was speaking to the Jewish people. When did Jesus stop teaching the Jews? Never. Right before Passover. When did Jesus stop? When did Jesus stop teaching the Jews? When did the when did Jesus stop teaching the Jews? When? When did the church cease to reach the Jewish people? Because that's the ministry Jesus came. And when did his mission change? Be before the Passover week. What? There was part in the Bible that says he already stopped exposing himself to the other Jews and just kept his disciples with him. So he did not anymore go out. So the apostles he trained for three years... Their mission wasn't to Israel and the Jewish people. It was to go to the Gentiles who would receive the message. Mm -hmm. Is that what happened? Well, Jesus went out again. That means that's what he does, right? If you want to model a missionary, model your missionary after Jesus. Because who was the perfect missionary? Jesus. Jesus. And if we want to follow Jesus, and we want to pattern our lives after Jesus, 
then we definitely have to have the heart that Jesus had for his own people Israel. Yeah. Same thing. And so, he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, Edward Levi, <laughs> sitting in his real estate office. And Rochelle, what did Jesus say to Levi? Follow me. Follow me. <clears throat> Does the scripture say that Levi says, well, Lord, right now I'm working. I'm collecting taxes. April 15th is coming very quickly. And I just, I'm too busy. How many Christians say that to the Lord? Is the Lord calling you to be a missionary? And what should be our response when we hear Jesus calling? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hineni? And what does that mean? Here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. And Jesus turns around and says, I'm going to send you to my people Israel. Oh, no. <laughs> I won't go. You can send me there, anywhere else, but I don't want to go to them. Is that what we're supposed to do in response to his call? Leave. What does the scripture say? What's his response? So he arose and followed him. That's what he did. He arose and he followed him. Wow, oh, that must have been one experience of a day to just go to your office one morning, be about your work, and then all of a sudden here comes Jesus, and Jesus says, follow me, and you just get up and you walk off the job and you follow Jesus. Is that what Matthew did? No. No. No? He followed him. And the scripture goes on to say this. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house. Oh my, now, now not only is he following Jesus, but he's inviting Jesus into his house. How many are ready to invite Jesus into your house to use your house as a mission Mary house are we seeing a pattern here you see this is an example of a missionary house where the people can be gathered and be taught and what's Jesus going to do in Levi's house what do we read he said this. He was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples for there were many and they followed him. Wait a minute. What kind of man was Matthew Levi? Tax collector. He was a tax collector. What is it about tax collectors we read about in the Holy Scriptures? How dare you collect taxes for Rome? We like our IRS. Oh, we don't let IRS agents in our house. <laughs> I spent many years preparing tax returns for individuals and small businesses, and the last thing you wanted was to have to deal with the IRS. Extensions. <laughs> well, you can file extensions, but whenever you got a letter from the IRS, they would assign an IRS agent, and they're the worst people on the planet. Company house. <laughs> Nobody likes a tax collector. I get mad going to the county of San Bernardino having to pay property taxes. What is Jesus doing? Inside the house of a tax collector, 
Rochelle, you're not going to reach Jewish people if you represent the enemy of Israel. Was Rome a friend or foe of Israel? Now, why would Matthew Levi want to collect taxes for Rome? Makes him rich. Yeah. <laughs> because nine times out of ten, they were crooked. They profited. Mm -hmm. See, they would collect taxes, but they would also collect what? Bribes. Bribes. There was a lot of money to be made as a tax collector. And Matthew Levy's home was full of tax collectors and <coughs> sinners. So what's the relationship between tax collectors and sinners that we read about in the Holy Scripture, Rochelle? If they were of the caliber that we're saying they were the ones that were collecting bribes and dealing dishonestly with the people, then they were also a sinner. It, the words could be... Who would want to bring those kind of people into your house? <laughs> but you know what the Scripture said? They also followed Jesus. Just like Matthew followed Jesus. So what did they become? These tax collectors, these sinners, followed Jesus. What's the secret to get people to follow Jesus? Man, wouldn't you like to have the power that Jesus was exemplifying here? That all he had to say to Matthew was, follow me. And he left everything and followed him. And then go to his house, open your home, invite a bunch of other tax collectors and sinners into your home, and guess what is about to happen? They too are going to be followers of Jesus. You know what that's called? Discipleship. Isn't that what we gather in these homes for? To make disciples? Are you not being taught in these Houses. These are not houses of worship. These are private residences. Was Matthew Levy's house a church or a temple, a synagogue? No. It was a private home that he opened up so that Jesus can do what? Draw others to himself. Were they sitting in the living room just like this? Yes. 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 Here's we got a snapshot of Jesus' house to house missionary work. How many houses are potential mission houses? Everywhere. 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 And all it takes is for Jesus to have access to one Jewish home. Will that open up the possibility for other Jewish people to get saved in that home? Isn't that what just happened in this? Right here. Because what compelled them to want to follow Jesus? Did Jesus say the same thing to them that he said to Matthew? Or did he preach the gospel to them? How did he win them over, Rochelle. How did these tax collectors and sinners become followers of Jesus in one meeting? How? So if you're really preaching the word of God, you're going to get results. Amen. So here's my question. How many times do we have to preach to somebody to win them over to Jesus. How long does it take to, to win one Jewish person hearing the word of God time and time again? How long does it take for one Jew to become a follower of Jesus? Well, why was it any different? We see Jesus doing it with his power. Boom! He's getting results. Wouldn't we want the same results? Is Jesus in this house today? Yes. Where? Yes. Show me. 
And each one of us. In each one of us. Yes. You know what that makes each one of us? Mm -hmm. Like Jesus. And if we did what Jesus did, will we get the same results? Yes. Yes. So why isn't it happening? Why aren't our churches filling up with Jews getting saved? Because the church members aren't doing Jewish missionary work. Should they? Yes. 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 That's the example from the very beginning that we were given. If we really are followers of Jesus, then we would be doing what Jesus was doing during his missionary days on earth. And if we truly have Jesus in us, doesn't he already know how to win his people, Israel, to himself? If you let Jesus do his work in and through you, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be many followers of Jesus. But that's going to happen. One thing's got to happen. You've got to get past yourself. It's not I who do the work. But it's Jesus in me who's doing the work. Isn't that what Christians claim every day? I do not live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who, who died and gave himself for me. See, Jesus is giving you a great example of how missionary work works wherever the Lord sends you anticipate that he's going to draw to himself the people that he's already chosen will be his people see Jesus said all that the father has given to me will come to me and of all who come to me I will in no wise cast anybody out and of all whom the father has given me I will not lose one so there's not one Jew that's going to be lost who belongs to Jesus. So the question is, when is it the responsibility of the church to reach the Jewish people? Since the beginning of the church age. And throughout the church age, it is the responsibility of Christians to be reaching the Jews for Jesus. Now, it happened. As he was dining in Levi's house, like we dine in Rochelle's house, right? You should have bagels and cream cheese. <laughs> and kosher salami, you do? Do you? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Because when I'm done here, that's where I'm going to be. Yeah. Yes. And I believe all of us are going to do the same thing. Right? We want the bread. We want the cheese, we want the kosher salami, and we're, because we're good Orthodox Jews, we don't mix the two. If you notice, Pastor Gill takes one bagel with cream cheese, and the meat is separate. Oh, wow. oh yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not like the Christians that do wrong things in front of Jews. Because whatever I do, I don't want to be an offense to who? So I take time to learn what is not to offend them. So I don't bring pig. <laughs> we must do what we make them mixed in Jiva Jiva. Amen. And that means you gotta learn to act, to think, and to be just like a Jew. Like Paul said, I am all things to all people that I might what? Win some. Now, inside Matthew Levy's house were a bunch of tax collectors and sinners. We're told that in the Holy Scriptures, right? So here's the question. Who 
was raising up complaints in Levi's home. What does the scripture say? It happened as he was what dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples for there were many. Uh oh, that's very unorthodox. Orthodox Jews will not sit down and eat with you if you are a Gentile. To do so would make them unclean. They will not even shake your hand because they're not going to touch you, our uncircumcised, unclean Gentiles. Jews are a holy people to God. If you don't believe me, hang around with me when I go into a Jewish community. I had the privilege of eating with an Orthodox Jew by the name of Eliyahu Katz. Rochelle can testify because you were there too. That brother sat down next to me and had me eat off of his plate. A privilege the others didn't have. Because you want to know why? They were not kosher. Because they were eating what Gentiles eat. In the house of a Gentile Christian, this Orthodox Jew would not compromise his walk with his God. He would maintain kosher holiness. He ate on separate plates, separate silverware, and food that was from a kosher place. So they don't eat like the rest of the Gentiles eat. To be able to eat off of his plate was an honor. Because what he's saying to me, you are me. Listen, if we're going to reach the Jewish people, we have to learn to respect what they consider holy mm -hmm. and sacred. Because to do to the contrary would be to the Jewish people sacrilegious, blasphemous. And so it was in Matthew Levy's house. There were many tax collectors and sinners. We are told that. We're given that intel. And when the scribes and Pharisees, now who were the scribes and who were the Pharisees hanging out at Matthew Levy's house that day? The religious leaders. The religious leaders. The Orthodox Jews. The ones that are looking at you and studying you and observing you. Because why? They strive to walk in strict obedience to the Torah. And for the scribes and the Pharisees, your Torah is not their Torah. Because their Torah is made up of four parts. The written, the oral, the oral that has been what? Written, we find in the commentaries. So when you're sitting going over the Holy Scriptures, you have to understand something. They're not looking at the scripture the way you and I look at scripture. And see, as missionaries, we need to become familiar how to go over the Holy Scriptures with the Jewish people who don't interpret and understand the Holy Scriptures like you and I interpret and understand the Holy Scriptures. Are you sort of understanding that we have to learn the customs? We have to learn the traditions? of the Jewish people for a reason so that we can reach them because we're going to be in their homes we're going to to be amongst them in in community centers and in communities where we find the Jewish people and we can't be thinking like what the scribes and the Pharisees because scribes and Pharisees are found not only in Jewish circles but where else 
in Gentile churches who judge Jews. Yes. God, look at them doing this. He's dominating. Oh, how ritualistic. But how long does that Christian spend in prayer every day? You know there's some churches that won't even have a prayer service before worship. Because they're too busy getting ready for what? For service. What's more important? The church service or the prayer time before the church service? The prayer. The prayer time. So why do we judge Jewish people for devoting so much time to prayer and to Torah study? Why do they do that, Rochelle? They have a heart for God. If more Christians had that kind of heart for God, I can guarantee you more churches would have a heart for Israel. Because how can you have a heart for God, who is the God of Israel, and how can you say, I follow the Messiah of Israel, when the Messiah of Israel isn't putting a burden in your heart for the very people that he came to save? But Matthew Levy's house was filled with tax collectors and sinners, but it was also filled with scribes and Pharisees who were the religious leaders. And what did they observe? Well, it says this. When the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, he is immediately disqualified from being the Jewish Messiah. There's no way a Jewish Messiah would be doing that. So I ask you today, why do people in Jewish circles do not believe that your Jesus is their Messiah? They're not plugged in to what uh, God is saying all over. Huh? They're not plugged in. Scribes and Pharisees devote the majority of their day in prayer and in the study of the Holy Scriptures. You would think that the very scriptures that speak of Jesus, they would understand that this man sitting here mm -hmm. is none other than the Messiah himself. Yes. But they didn't see it. They were blinded by their own religious what? Prejudice. Their religious pride. Mm -hmm. And pride in a religious Christian is no different than pride in an Orthodox Jew. The Orthodox Jew will not sit with a Christian and sup. And a holier-than-thou Christian will have nothing to do with those Jews. Call it for what it is. There's discrimination on both sides. In many Israel, we must never, ever be like that. And so... How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? How could this be? How dare you, church member, gather in a Jewish home on a Jewish Shabbat and do what you're doing? That's all Jewish stuff. And then come and sit and praise Jesus on Sunday morning, your church, when you have done that the day before. Wow. If you don't think you're being judged, then take a look around you. Have we not invited pastors to come to our Shabbat only to be told, I will not betray my Lord? Mm -hmm. Whoa! <laughs> then what you just told me and Rochelle we are betrayers of the Lord for doing what we do. 
Is that a true testimony, Rashad? Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yes. And what Jesus and his disciples were experiencing that day was discrimination. They were being judged by the religious leaders of the day. And so, when Jesus heard it, that means they must have been discussing it among themselves. Does Jesus hear what's going on today? Wow. Does Jesus hear what Christians say in the privacy of their own home and what they say in their Bible study groups at church when they are bad-mouthing the Jewish people and, and condemning them and judging them as, as a ritualistic, you know, you know, Kabbalistic magicians? Because Jews do study and practice Kabbalah. It's the fourth part of the Torah. It's that wisdom that is hidden. Only open to those who are chosen to be the luminaries. Until the end of the age when all of humanity will be open to Kabbalistic mysteries. Because the Messiah is coming. That's what they will teach you. One of the biggest challenges I have in ministering and witnessing to Jews is called You must have a strategy. You must have a strategy. You have your own personal. How to deal with those arguments that are going to come against you. Need, need a personal platform. Personal. Absolutely. Because most of us treat them like Jehovah's Witnesses coming to your front door. You've already slammed the door in their face. But that's not the way to do it. That's not the way to do it. Would you invite Jehovah's Witnesses into your home? Well, I, I get, to, get, get, get to know that person. Of course. And in order to invite Jews into your home, you have to get to know that person. And you have to have a respect for their what? For their traditions, for their customs, for their beliefs. You see, Christians, we all have the potential to be great missionaries to the Jewish people if we would only open our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to the Jewish people through us. We would get the results because it's not us, it's the Holy Spirit. And I'll guarantee you, the Holy Spirit is not going to treat them with the kind of animosity that they're being treated like here. Right? Because God is no respecter of persons. Everyone who comes to him, who seeks him by faith, is accepted by him. Those who live their lives in fear of him are accepted by him. Remember Peter in the house of a Roman soldier came to understand, I had it wrong all these years. I have learned that God is no respecter of persons. Anybody from any nation, from any people group, no matter who you are, those who fear him, those who strive to keep his commandments, those who strive to do good are accepted by him. Amen. That's why you need to know where you are in terms of your growth since the first time you became a believer. Right there. Because if there's no growth in your walk with Jesus, then there's nothing happening in your heart. And if that heart that hated Jews when you first came to Christ, 50 years later hates Jews even more, don't talk to me about your Jesus because you don't have him in your heart. Because my Jesus doesn't hate the Jewish people. My God is not anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, anti-Zionist. Amen. Amen. But we have churches full of haters of Jews and anti-Semitic preachers and teachers and, and scholars who are trying to convince you and me that we have nothing to do with the Jewish people. Yes. You've got to be a Methodist. Methodist. Okay. Even method. Take the denominations <laughs> out of here, okay? Because we're not here into denominationalism. Hebrew Christian Witness is a non-sectarian, non-denominational organization. You've got your own method in your platform. Well, the methodology is simply this. 
study the Torah under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to live and act and move through you. Yes. And God will open doors to the Jewish people beyond what we could do on our own. That's just how it is. So, where are we going to find these Jewish people? Everywhere. Everywhere. Jesus knew where to find his next disciple. In an office that was manned by one Jewish Levite. Because I believe that's what he was, right? He was a Levite. Why would Jesus target a Levite to be a follower? They have a beginning. There's something about the Levitical priesthood that must occur before the Messiah comes. And so, here we go. Once again, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. Yes. But those who are sick, you know what that's called? It's called an analogy. We're not talking about sick people here. So why are you bringing up the subject of sickness and the need of physicians? So how is Jesus dealing with these scribes and Pharisees, Rochelle? In an allegorical way. Okay. And you see, Jews learn and study Torah allegorically. Because there are depths of levels in understanding Torah. You need to be fully aware of that when you're studying or sitting and dialoguing with the Jewish people. See, Christians look at it like this. In other words, the Word of God is flat like the earth. And if you get too far, you'll sink into the abyss. But the wisdom of God has depth. It has height, it has length, and it has what? Yeah. Width. It's multidimensional. That means that if you are so literal in your interpretation of Scripture, you might miss the other dimensions of it. Right? So you see, they were being challenged by their very method of teaching, allegorically, and the use of what? Parables. Did Jesus teach that way? Just like the Jewish people have been taught for thousands of years. And so, once again, the sick need physicians to be made well, while these tax collectors and sinners need Jesus to be made well well. And that's why Jesus is in the house with them. So, that having been said, what is the goal? I did not come to call the righteous. Was he making, oops, was he making reference to the scribes and the Pharisees as the righteous? The Sadiq. Yeah, they're the Sonics. They're the ones that walk and strive to live by the strictness of the law. So yeah, they have an issue with breaking the law by being around a bunch of tax collectors and sinners. You shouldn't co-mingle with them. But Jesus said, listen, I didn't come to call the righteous Sinners. But sinners to repentance. So you see, we can spend our days in our gatherings among other righteous believers like us and never reach sinners beyond our circles. That's sad. That is sad. Because we just declared today that every Jew that does not believe in Jesus is a sinner. And we need to call sinners to what? Repentance. 
They need to have a change of mind and a change of heart when it comes to Jesus as the Messiah. And how are they going to do that unless somebody goes and tells them about Jesus? How are they going to come to repentance unless somebody goes out there and does the work of a missionary? Yes, amen. Men, we're not going to do that hanging out in our churches. <laughs> Playing church when we've left our first love should be for God's holy people Israel. Because when you study church history, the very first love of the church was to take and be a blessing back to the Jewish people from whom the Messiah came. Until Christianity was Romanized and became anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish. Right? There you go. And forget the Sabbath day. Let's just do it on another day so we can separate ourselves even more from the Jewish people and from the Jewish religion, from the Jewish faith called Judaism. Wasn't Christianity coming out of Judaism? Or did Judaism come out of Christianity? There you go. Let's get it right. So now, the last question is why would Mark refer to Matthew as Levi, when Matthew himself didn't refer to himself as Levi, because we get this same account, where we show? In Matthew's gospel, right here. In chapter 9 of verse 9, we read, in Matthew's gospel, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the office and he said to him follow me so he arose and followed him now it happened as jesus sat at the table in the house well matthew doesn't even specify that it was his house they were sitting in so matthew's leaving out a lot of details that mark included why would he do that rochelle Censorship. You don't want to write to the Jewish people that you've been doing unorthodox things. That was in my house. Jesus didn't go to my house. I wasn't there with a house full of tax collectors and sinners. Those kind of people don't hang out in my house. Was Matthew being a little bit more what? Careful. Careful. Not to be an offense to the Jewish audience that he was writing to. Because Mark wasn't writing to the Jews. Mark was writing to who? Gentiles. Is that sort of being discriminate in how we communicate? Depending on who the group that we're communicating the gospel to? Yeah. See, there's not one size fits all. You have to adjust things to the particular people group that you're dealing with as part of our missionary work. And so, that could be one consideration. We know that it was Matthew's house, but why did Matthew not refer to himself as leaving? He referred to himself as man, Matthew. That would be like Rochelle saying, hi, I'm Pearl. <laughs> it's not Rochelle's oyster, it's the Pearl oyster. When you try to get a hold of Rochelle on the phone, and you get her voicemail and says, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Pearl oyster. The Pearl oyster is what? <laughs> Shut it. So you're just going to have to wait. Well, why doesn't she refer to it as the Rochelle oyster? Because I didn't call Pearl, I called Rochelle. See, we don't refer to ourselves by our last name. So was Mark showing reverence and respect for Matthew? Or is there something significant to referring to him as Levi? Maybe because he comes from that tribe of Levi. 
Is there any relevance as to what tribe a Jew comes from? In the area of mathematics, it's called the, the is a given. It's a given. Yes. And what is that given? It does not change every word you open a conversation or. Well, I want to know why he omitted some facts. He didn't identify the house as being his own, and he's not referring to himself as Levi. He's referring himself to Matthew. Maybe that's part of a cover-up that says, the man that you read about in Mark's Gospel, that's not me. Mm -hmm. I'm Matthew. That was Levi. And that's another tax collector in another office, so don't come judging me. Could that be a possibility? We don't know. Yeah. It could be. But anyway, it says this. Many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Now we're given an added piece of information. In other words, the Pharisees and the scribes were speaking to the disciples of Jesus. And that's why Jesus heard it. So you see, those concerns were being addressed to who? The disciples. Why didn't they just take it to Jesus directly? The religious leaders of today, when we as disciples of Jesus who follow Jesus and are taking the gospel to the Jewish people, when we come into Jewish circles, do we wear Jesus hats and Jews for Jesus t-shirts and have crosses like crusaders? Is that the way we come into their homes? Is that the way we come into their communities? No! When we go into a Jewish temple or synagogue, what do we wear, Rochelle? Fits the... the regalia of the Jewish people. Why? Because we are showing respect to their culture, Adaptation, yeah. to their customs, to their, their traditions. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher, in other words, why does your rabbi eat with tax collectors and sinners? Did they mean that as a compliment? Or were they gravely concerned that somehow this rabbi is not who he claims to be? Because he's doing things in an unorthodox manner. When Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. Wait a minute. We didn't read about that in Mark's gospel, so what is Matthew doing here? Is he spinning the story? Are we getting a different account? Maybe it's a different See, yeah. what we're reading in Matthew's Gospel is this. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Why did Mark <coughs> omit that in his Gospel? It's a given. It's a given. Because the audience that he was writing to would not understand what this means. Matthew wrote his gospel specifically for what group of people were shot? For the Jews. The Jewish people. And Christian missionaries would learn very well that you have to target your message, your teaching, your mannerisms and everything to the very people that you are reaching with the gospel. You can't go in there acting all Christian and forcing your beliefs and forcing your practices and the way you do things because you will be an offense and a stumbling block to them. 
The question is, who really wants to take time to learn Jewish customs, Jewish traditions, Jewish beliefs? It's easier just to be what? A regular Gentile Christian. To be a Jewish missionary takes a special type of person who truly has a heart and a burden for Israel and the Jewish people. And if that's your heart, then let us be like Matthew Levy. Let us follow Jesus wherever he leads. You know, your basic instruction before leaving earth. They're leaving the earth? The ideally. Basic instruction before leaving earth. That's before. your the word then. Very good. And how long have we had this instruction? When was the Torah given to the Jewish people? Four thousand years ago? And for four thousand years they have been given instruction how to live on this earth before they leave this earth. And in those very instructions they can learn about my Jesus. So why aren't they living it? Because they're not learning it. Why? Because they don't see it. They're blind. Yeah. And they, they have eyes to see, but they don't see. They have ears to hear, but they don't hear. They have hearts, but they don't understand. Understand this. They're spiritually blind. Does Jesus have the power to open their eyes, open their ears, so they will know and understand that he is the Messiah? Yeah. Yes. 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 So with that, we continue reading Matthew's Gospel because it goes into the very heart of this message and is simply this. Understand what Jesus said. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The gospel that doesn't call sinners to repentance is not the gospel at all. Mm -hmm. Depends depend on the timing. Yeah. timing. We have to show the fruits of repentance in our daily lives. You may be called to be a follower of Jesus years ago, but I can assure you, the more you follow Jesus, the more you're going to have a heart for the very people that Jesus came to save, and that was his people, Israel. The Jewish people. Because that's God's first love. And how can we have a heart after God's own heart when we hate the very people he loves? You see the contradictions there? So we need to check our hearts. And with that having been said, note what Jesus can do. While he spoke these things to him. Where is this taking place? In the house of Levi. In a house gathering like this. What is happening? A ruler came and worshipped him saying, my daughter has just died. But come, lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now, are they leaving the house? Yes. yes. What are they going to go do? Shouldn't missionaries do the same thing? There's an urgency. And so, what does Jesus say? And suddenly, right? A woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind, touched him, the hem of his garment, for she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. Whoa, is that Kabbalah? What is so magical about his garment? That no. I have enough background in Roman Catholicism to know that if there's something that is that powerful, they will pray to it like a relic. If this was a shroud 
that was worn by a woman who claims to have had an encounter with the Virgin Mary. They worship the shroud because it's got powers mm -hmm. to heal you. This woman believed that all she had to do was touch the hem of his garment and she would be what? Healed. Where is the power of Jesus today? Do we see it in our churches today? No. It's not there. We hear a lot of preaching and a lot of teaching. But where's the power? You see, there was power in his ministry. And suddenly... We see what? But Jesus turned around and, and when he saw her said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has done what? Made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. What the physicians couldn't do for 12 years, and she spent all her money paying doctors for healing that never came, right? Never. It's like cancer patients. They spend every last dollar they got for nothing but an empty promise of healing that never comes. This woman had faith in Jesus that all I have to do is touch the hem of his garment and the power of God would make her whole. Jesus did not rebuke her for her superstitious faith. No, on the contrary. Be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the, and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead. But sleeping. Rochelle, what was their response? They ridiculed him. They make fun of him. Yes. The way they make fun of Pastor Gill for believing that the church has something to do in the tribulation period. I get ridiculed all the time. They made fun of me when I wore a kippah to church and seat seat and wrapped myself in a tallit doing Jewish things. Why? Because people, even religious people, will make fun of you when they see that you are different than everyone else. That's another reason why people don't get involved with Jewish missionary work, because it makes you what? Different. Don't you know that the Jewish people have been spiritually dead for 2,000 years? They can't even learn that Jesus is the Messiah by studying the very scriptures that point to the Messiah. Or you must make them jealous. I don't want to make them jealous, brother. I want to see them get saved. Yeah. Well, I don't want to make them jealous. Well, they will. They will be I want to see them get saved. Yes. In other words, I want to see my Jesus save my people Israel from their sins because that's what He came to do. If they are blind, Jesus, give them their sight. If they are dead in their trespasses and sin, bring them back to what? Life. You see, understand this. They ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report went out into all the land. A dead girl was brought back to life. A dead Jew brought back to life by the power of God in Christ Jesus the Lord. 
a woman's flow of blood ceased. What physicians couldn't do, with all of their medical training, Jesus did by what? Working through the faith of that woman. Yes. And lastly, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. In other words, have mercy on us. Two blind Jews followed Jesus. They were blind. And you want to know what Jesus had already declared in the house of Levi? It was simply this. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Does Jesus still desire mercy yes. and not sacrifice? Yes. yes. And so... When he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to him, do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. And here's my question to you, men of Israel. Do you believe Jesus can save the Jews today? Yes. Do you really believe that? Yes. Does the church believe that? Maybe. Amen. Yes. Does the church really believe that Jesus has the power to bring the dead Jews back to life, to take the blind Jews and give them their sight? Yes. Yes. You know what it takes? It takes the faith of the believing church yes. to bring about the salvation of the Jewish people. But in order for that to happen, they really have to pray believing that God will do it. And if they've already decided they're not going to pray in the morning before church, they've already shut the door. Which is a good sign of their unbelief. And the more churches get away from preaching to the Jewish people the gospel of our salvation, so they too can be saved like us, they really don't believe the Jews are worth saving or spending a dollar to send missionaries to call those sinners to repentance, which is the whole mission of Jesus himself. And think about it. You see, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their eyes were open. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But they had departed. And they spread the news about him in all that country. That country is Israel. Every born-again believer in Jesus should be spreading the news among the Jewish people. Especially in that country. Because you see, when you've had an encounter with Jesus Christ, you cannot shut your mouth about Jesus. Amen. You want to tell everybody about Jesus. <clears throat> Especially the Jewish people. Their speech was restored. Their sight was restored. A dead Jewish girl was brought back to life by the power of Jesus. Does Jesus still have the power to work miracles? Yeah, but Jesus is in heaven right now. So the only people that the world can see any evidence of Jesus is in the disciples who claim to know him and be followers of him. And so I'm going to bring you to what Jesus concludes in this story. And that's simply this then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. 
But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. When I see the Jewish people scattered, they are weary, they are scattered like sheep with no shepherd. Especially when I see them mourning as they mourn in the streets and in the cities of Israel and throughout the world when you have chance to their death and the whole world is ready to annihilate the planet of every Jew. Christian, where are you in all of this? Sadly, Pastor, the churches are very different. Yeah, they're indifferent because they really don't care. They don't even they don't pray for Israel because they don't desire the mercy of God upon Israel. What they want is this, like a little kid. Ah, ha, 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 you get to go in the tribulation. We get to go to heaven and rejoice. I think they're just satisfied that they are saved. Yes. They stop at that. They, they couldn't care less for the rest because they are saved. People who don't care about other people's salvation are selfish people. Mm -hmm. They love themselves, but they don't have a love for anybody else but themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't even talk about Israel churches. Of course not. And that's why we're having this message. You see, what is Jesus' desire? What is in the heart of our king? But that more people would go out and do what? Tell his people about Jesus. Hmm about Jesus and see it says it again he had compassion and you see then he said to his disciples the harvest truly is plentiful but the laborers are few therefore do what pray the Lord of the harvest that he will do what send out those Jewish missionaries and that's what we must do man Israel pray the Lord of the harvest that he will put compassion in the hearts of those Gentile Christians sitting in those churches complacent Self-soothe in their own what? Lukewarm churches. Get up and go what? Make disciples. Make disciples of the Jewish people. Because the hour is late and the days are evil. And there's coming a time when no one can work. Today is the day of salvation for Israel. Today is the day Amen. that a Jew gets saved. Amen? Amen. And I'll leave it with that. And Pastor, let me just mention that this August, there is a little bit change in Emmanuel Baptist. Pastor, Dr. Morgan now start to pray for Israel. Well, praise God. Before Our prayers are being answered. Before the service, he says, come on, let's pray for Israel. And, yes. That is a good sign yes. coming Amen. from the leader. That's the Because it begins God. with the leadership and then it, 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 it spreads among the people. Amen? You are the but, missionaries. But, you know, Your prayers mean something to the Lord and when you ask God for something because Jesus really believed that the prayers of his disciples would get answers. Yes, and we thank God for Rowena who is so faithful in going to the chapel and before the service Amen. there is a prayer from 8.30 to 8.45 and this is so faithful. There you go. <laughs> With that is a prayer word. You're all prayer words. You're all in the army of the Lord. Amen. And we're going to win this war. We'll take this battle all the way into the tribulation <laughs> period. We don't want to go into the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Now I got all these ones not wanting to go in the pre-trib. <laughs> now I got to work on this side. Amen. <laughs> all right, Rochelle. Ignoring the jabs, I really bring us back to the Word of God. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces shalom, who brings good news of happiness, mm -hmm. who announces salvation, and says to Zion, your God reigns. Amen. 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 Majesty. Majesty. Let us exalt the name of Yeshua, Jesus. And let us pray for more hearts to be soft and to be tender, because sadly, the scripture tells us that they will stumble at the stone. He is the rock of offense. But they need to come to know and understand he is the rock that is their foundation. He is the rock that brought them the living waters. 
He is the rock of their salvation, as the psalmist declares. Let's even pray now for hearts and eyes to be opened. Sadly, it is a horrendous time in Israel. But out of this continuing tragedy, they're listening. Because when you're hurting, you're more open to hear. It's a strategic time to pray. And I'll make it very personal for those of you who know Eliyahu. It was the one that Pastor Gail brought up today. And in this last week, if you heard the news of the man who lost his life, that was Eliyahu's friend, lives in Kedamine with Eliyahu. Eliyahu heard the word God here. It was presented to him who his Messiah was. I believe to this day he struggles with that message. Mm -hmm. And at a time when he's buried his friend, I really believe he's contemplating mm -hmm. life and death yes. and what matters. His friend was killed by a co-worker mm -hmm. who had permission to be there and had presented himself as a friend. This is the lie of Satan. He's coming in camouflage, and the eyes are deceived. We've got to pray that the veil of blindness be removed, the eyes be open, and at a time like this, keep Eliyahu in your prayers. Because I pray it's, it's this that will be the final clincher where he will come into that saving faith. That mm -hmm. faith that is what the woman had when she wanted to touch the robe of the priestly garments. It was not Kabbalah. She had the right faith. That's why Yeshua could command her faith. And it made her whole in more ways than just the physical. That's the power of our God. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord God of Israel, our hearts do break. For our beloved Jewish brethren who don't know, who don't hear, who do not have an ear open, they're not listening. They're not hearing Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. O Lord, Hineni, hear my, send me, send us, send Emmanuel Israel. Lord, you've given us the words of life. You've given us the words of truth. You've given us the hope of Israel. You've given us you, Messiah and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. Oh, Lord, let us be your feet that are spreading the good news on the mountains, that are speaking salvation, and that are bringing the truth to the Eliyahu's of mm -hmm. this world. Yes. And Lord, at a time when he is personally hurting, at a time when death has come so close to him once again. Lord, his life has been spared. Perhaps because there is yet a day when he will give his life to you. Yes. And we plead for that. We stand yes. in that gap yes. as intercessors. Yes. And we plead yes. for that yes. at this very moment. And not just for Eliyahu alone, but for all of his brethren. Oh, you so our, Lord, our hearts, Lord, they just ache. You have given us your love, that we can love others. Lord, let them see in us your good works. See in us the Father in heaven, that it will draw them to their very own God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, Lord, touch them even now. Touch them at this moment. Touch them as they read the same scriptures that we're studying right yes. now. Yes. Lord, you're in those very scriptures. You're on those very pages. Let them not discuss what the rabbis say, but let them discuss what you say. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Lord, turn them back to the word of God. Turn them back to what gives them life. Turn them back mm -hmm. to the hope of Israel. May they come to understand Messiah has come. And Messiah is coming again. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. We praise you. We know you're coming in your perfect timing. And we're not here to argue that timing, mm -hmm. Lord. But while we are here, let us, by faith, let us work for you. 
Let us be your hands, your feet, and your voice. Yes. Let us cry out in the wilderness. Let us shout it from the mountaintops. And let us walk through the valley of the shadow of death yes. with our beloved Israel. Lord God, we desire this to reach the Gentiles also. It is not exclusive. And we praise and thank you for that. You died for the entire world. Yes. For God so loved the world. That as you've given us this view to go to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, we plead and we pray, Lord, let us bring one more Joshua. Let us bring one more and in bringing that one, let a dear Gentile come along too, that all might be saved. Yes. Lord, hear our cries. Take us, mold us, fill us and pour us out in service to you, that you might be glorified and one more might be saved. Oh, we give it to you, not in, in our power, not in our might, not thinking that we have, have anything to offer, but in the power of the Ruch HaKodesh should be placed within us. Lord, let it be so. And we say, Oh, main. Main. Amen. 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 Remember that word is far more than the period at the end of the sentence. That declaration, God, King, He is righteous. Mm -hmm. And may all of Israel be saved. Mm -hmm.